press on my <clears throat> Uh, the next man you hear has his own website, but it doesn't tell you everything about him. It does tell you, though, that he was a race car driver and raced in the last race that was ever made on this Daytona Beach before the banked track was made and holds the record, somewhere in the re records museum here, wherever it is, his name is listed as the fastest man that ever raced on the beach, for which he got a speeding ticket, <laughs> which was a gag, of course, but uh, they set him up at that time and had the cops come out, and he don't, probably don't know that I knew that. Uh, but they give him, uh, and he's been a bobsled racer and a lot of other things. But now he's doing stuff that's vitally interesting, of vital interest to us. And you've seen uh, some of his television productions, the one that went on Egypt that was hosted by Charlton Heston, and others you've seen. And now he's here to give us some more of his background and expertise in this field because it's of vital interest to a lot of our people. The Search for the Hall of Records is the title of it, but he can talk about whatever he wants. Welcome, Boris Said, for the first time here at Global Sciences. Thanks. If you will, please. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Wow. Thank you very much for showing up. I, uh, <laughs> that's, a, that's a tough act to follow, and I hope I don't get busted. <laughs> um, like most of you, in the last few days, we've been, we've been entertained and astonished and horrified and terrified. And I'm sure those of you here last night were, were, were really transfixed by the power of some of, the, some of the speakers and some of the things that have gone on here. So what I'm going to try and do, because I have no, <laughs> I have no agenda, <laughs> I've, um, I've been filming, working in Egypt for the last eight years, and I've been filming the work of Robert Schock from Boston University and John Anthony West, and uh, Tom Dobecki, a seismographer, uh, more recently, and some people from Florida State University. And uh, those of you, how many people here have, have been to Egypt? Oh, great. Well, OK, Mark Abba, thank you for coming. Um, it's, um, you probably know, any of you that have been following what's been going on on the net, that there's been a lot of controversy. There's been the war between Zahi Hawaz and practically everybody, uh, certainly John West and Graham Hancock and, and Robert Boval, and everybody has been accused of, of secrecy and skullduggery of one form or another. Now, I'm going to try to dispel all that now, okay? I've, I've been there looking through the camera, and I'm going to tell you what I've seen and what we've done. And uh, those of you that can do the workshop tomorrow will show you some of the forbidden footage, which is now involved in a lawsuit. We'll get into that. But um, let me just try and take you through this, and, and um, we'll see what we get. We'll try and have some questions later. Uh, I first went to Egypt in 1991 with John Anthony West. He was trying to get permission to, uh, to redate the Sphinx. He was trying to take Robert Schock into the enclosure and study the erosion patterns of the rock and prove that the Sphinx had predated uh, what we believe to have been a great flood, which would have made the Sphinx at least 9,000 years old and probably closer to 12 or 13,000 years old. Uh, we got to Boston University, we got to the American Embassy, we presented a huge, great presentation requesting permission to the Antiquities Department, and subsequently in the spring of night, in the fall of 1990, I went to Egypt to clear up our credentials, and I was greeted by the Secretary of the Antiquities Department with a with a diatribe. Uh, at the end of which he said, "Mubarak himself will not get you permission to enter the grounds of my Sphinx. We have all the information we need. Thank you very much. Uh, you will never." bring that infernal machine, referring to the seismograph, on the grounds of my sphinx. Over my dead body, sir, will you bring this machine? So I went home, and I, I called John Weston up in the airport, and I said, John, listen, I just met a guy who's got his heels cemented into the ground, and I said, I don't think you're going to get permission to do this. And then three weeks later, the guy dropped dead. 
And I went from being a skeptical ex-race car driver to running out to rent the Curse of the Mummy's Tomb, and, and I didn't know what I was getting into, but I thought to myself, boy, that's a, that was a pretty prophetic thing to have happen. The new secretary of the Antiquity Department was a student of Professor Shocks at Boston University, and so in six weeks we had our permission. Uh, at that point, another strange thing happened. We didn't have any money to go. We had permission to go, but we didn't have any money to go. And then the Gulf War started. And by the time the Gulf War was over, we had raised the money to go. So <laughs> it worked out. I mean, these things kept happening during the course of this, of this thing. And I began to believe that other forces were at work. I, I'm not going to get into that, but that's how we started. Subsequently, we did some seismic work and we established that because of the erosion patterns um, in the rock and in the ground, on the grounds of the Sphinx enclosure, on the walls, on the Sphinx itself, uh, Dr. Schock believed that it had been caused by a downfall of rain. And he was prepared to make a statement that Sphinx was at least 9,000 years old and probably more like 12,000 years old. While we were doing this one day around the front paws of the Sphinx, we were doing some seismic testing of the porosity of the stone, which Shock said would tell us how long it had been exposed, how long it had been carved flat, how long, the, the sphinx, how long ago the Sphinx had been carved. And in testing the porosity of the stone, we turned up a 30 by 40 foot rectangular, quote, anomaly, unquote, 32 feet deep uh, underneath the left front paw of the Sphinx which was right where Edgar Cayce said it would be, of course. And um, subsequently, uh, Charlton Heston made that statement at 9 o'clock prime time on NBC. And his line was great. He says, um, uh, wild fantasy, when he talked about Cayce, may be, but the seismograph, the seismograph does, not green, does not dream. I'm sorry. So to make a long story short, having established this, we went, then set about getting permission to enter the chamber. And in the ensuing two years, John Anthony and Robert Schock succeeded, I think, in alienating everybody in Egypt, except Cleopatra, perhaps. And, and they turned down all requests, and, and they would not let us work. Uh, in 1995, I went back on my own. I met with Dr. Hawaz. I said, look, we'd like to do a show built around you, an Egyptian show. And he promised to open a tunnel under the, to a room under the Sphinx that they had found originally in 1920. That it, he said it had never been opened. And armed with that, we put together another expedition. And the Shore Foundation in New York, Dr. Shore, got involved. And they put up a lot of money. And we began going back to Egypt to do seismic and radar testing. Now, expedition led to expedition over a course of two years. We reconfirmed that there was a room under the paw. We found a tunnel coming out of the back of the Sphinx that was about 18 feet down and leading directly towards the Khafra Pyramid, the middle pyramid. We also, uh, at that time, heard a legend. And the legend was that there had been a well dug uh, towards the end of World War II. And the two kids digging the well had fallen through the bottom of the well as they were chipping away at the stone while it was still dry. The bottom collapsed, and they fell into a cavern. And in the cavern, they found themselves lying on a sarcophagus lid. And they decided they had disturbed the, the resting place of the dead, and they, they fled to the surface. And, and so nothing further was done. The well was abandoned. Subsequently, the Aswan Dam was built, raising the water level uh, on the Giza Plateau, the ambient water level, by about 50 feet. And it flooded the well, and they went down in there with pumps, and it began pumping water. So while we were down there looking for a way into the Sphinx, way, looking for a way into the chamber, because the Egyptians were not so keen to dig right around the edge of the Sphinx, we were looking for a tunnel. We were looking for some other sort of entrance. And we, in fact, located this well. We rappelled down into it. We set up our radar down at the bottom of it. And we discovered a 2 and a half meter wide anomaly with a domed ceiling leading directly towards the Sphinx, 275 meters away. Uh, and this, this was clearly a tunnel. Our geologists said it was a tunnel. So that 
basically is what we accomplished over a period of, of three years. And you might say, well, gee whiz, how come we haven't seen this on television? What happened was that after our last voyage over there in 1996, when we had discovered this, this well and this, this, this tunnel, Dr. Shore had his permit canceled, permit to explore canceled. Now, he never bothered to tell us that small fact. We had a filming permit, but, but when we went back in February to film in the well, we had no permit. And I'll spare you the gory details of that one, but suffice to say that when we got down there and turned on the radar and Eureka found a tunnel and I ran to the Antiquities Committee and said, look what we found, they said, you're acting illegally, turn off the radar, you have no permission to use it. At that point, uh, Fox, uh, who are, uh, Fox, of course, is owned by Rupert Murdoch, who is a 33rd degree Mason. Fox met with us to negotiate releasing the film and they wanted absolute editorial right over everything that we'd done, including the 42 minutes of finished film that was in the box. And I said, well, look, um, I don't mind if you edit what we don't, haven't done, but I would like to know what you like and what you don't like about the footage that we've already done. And they were not interested. So I wouldn't sign the contract. And Fox stepped out and uh, took their money with them, and I got sued by the Shore Foundation, and all of the footage got locked up. Now, the reason that I didn't sign was that I felt that the integrity of the project would be threatened if we give veto power to some guy who is a 33rd-degree Mason with his own agenda. I couldn't understand why he wanted a veto power over something we'd already finished. So a lot of the footage which I have with me is at the moment subject to a, a lawsuit. I can't use it. Um, I have taken a lot of high eight footage and a lot of photographs, and I have pieced together a story of what we did. And it's for sale back there at Booth 17, where we sort of did a, a bootleg tape, which, which is a, a composite that covers all our work. Uh, and then I decided for my own protection, and again, I don't, <laughs> I don't want to get into conspiracies here, but I thought, well, if I take this thing public and tell people what is going on, then perhaps we can get through all of this secrecy and get permission to do our work. So I went on the Art Bell Show. I got a lot of publicity. I got a website. We're getting 2,500 hits a day. A lot of people wrote me letters and emails and, and uh, letters of support. And I hired an attorney in Egypt. We sent him all of these letters. We sent him all of this support. We sent him about 4,000 letters. And after the Luxor disaster in November, when the tourism came to a stop in Egypt, I was invited to come to Egypt. I went the first week in December. And I met with a general who's the brother-in-law of the president, who assured me that he was going to get permission for the University of Cairo to drill a hole into the chamber under the paw, and that we would be allowed to pass a camera through that hole if we could guarantee them a television audience. You got to understand, <laughs> they have a three and a half billion dollar tourist industry each year, and they're operating at about 8% right now. So they're pretty desperate for publicity. And I think what happened was this elevated the problem above all of the underlings and flunkies and people who were struggling for ego identification and put it smack in the ministerial offices and it brought it before the president. And I think that's how we got our permission or how we're getting our permission. Uh, I'm really happy to be able to tell you that about half an hour before I came down here, I spoke to my attorney in Egypt and he believes they are going to allow us to drill that hole in April. They're looking for an engineering firm, right? OK. I hope. Uh, this, is, this is really hot off the presses. Uh, it's gone this far. My attorney's looking for a firm of engineers in Egypt who will be acceptable to the government, who have to do a study to convince the government that the Sphinx won't fall down if we drill a three-inch hole at an angle into the paw. And it's a, it's a legitimate question. I mean, you know, they don't know what we're doing. And, and, um, but. It, it looks like that we will have succeeded. This will be an effort by the University of, of, of Cairo. This will be sponsored by the Egyptian government. And we will make the film in conjunction with an Egyptian television station. 
So all of the, all of the agendas of ex exploitation and everything that's come before are out the window now, and I think it exonerates the Egyptians who've been accused of, of keeping secrets. I don't think they're keeping secrets. I think that guys like Graham Hancock are forgetting that it's Egypt, and it's an Egyptian monument. It's a symbol of Egypt. It's their heritage. It's their history, and it's their secret. So I think that having finally gotten across to them the fact that we want them to tell the story is what has made the difference. Anyway, I hope so. So I thank you for your applause, and I hope by fall <laughs> that we're going to have a, have a video to show at least of some of the artifacts that, that the spy camera uh, finds going down through that hole. Uh, one of the things that we're hoping to do is persuade them to drill a, make a tunnel, actually actually enter the chamber. And we've told them that if they would agree to do that, subsequent to the hole and subsequent to the camera going down in there, that we would do a live show, that we would do a live via satellite show and beam it all over the world and they could actually step into this chamber for the first time. So is it Atlantis? Is it the Hall of Records? I don't know. I mean, I'm not, I'm not a scholar. I'm a, I'm a television producer and writer. So I'm going to leave it up to everybody's imagination. I've been told that they've already been in there. I've been told that a lot of the artifacts have been taken. There are predictions that there are rooms under the room. One of the limitations of the radar is it can only go down one level at a time. So it is conceivable that when we get in there, we'll have to set the radar up again and go down a level. I mean, there are a lot of possibilities. But at least we seem to have created a, a working relationship with the Egyptian government which is going to allow us, in a, in a scholarly way, with doing, giving due respect to the Egyptians, to tell the world about the secrets that are there. So, I mean, that is, that's the first part of what I had to say. Now, having said all that, um, and I don't want to get too heavy into this hole in the ground, my, my feeling has always been that if there was a, if we were preceded by a highly advanced society, which had the kind of technologies that Egypt is rumored to have had and Atlantis is rumored to have had. Why would they take these secrets and bury them in the ground like a King Charles Cocker Spaniel buries his bone? I mean, if they were that bright, why would they dig a hole and, and hide it? And it's led us to doing a sort of a, a parallel investigation of the Great Pyramid. And that's what I'd like to talk a little bit about before we open this to questions. Um, to me, that 480-foot pyramid is a relic of Atlantis, or at least of a previous highly advanced civilization. I'm sure you're all aware that there are a lot of mathematical uh, relevancies, and if you divide the length by the width and multiply by the height, you get the location in Mexico and whatever, whatever. There are Carl Monk's mathematical work. Um, certainly, Robert Boval with his Orion Mysteries has talked about how the air shafts or star shafts line up with the planets, uh, with, the, with the stars in the Orion's belt. There are all of these different stories. We've done some parallel investigation with sound, and I'd like to talk just a little bit about that. We took a, an engineer from NASA who had done some levitation experiments in our first film, and we took him to Egypt with us, and we hired the pyramid for four nights. And we took Tom inside and we put sensors in all of the rooms, in the Queen's Chamber, down in the room at the base of the pyramid. We even got up into the five chambers above the King's Chamber, Nelson's Chamber, Lady Arbuthnot's Chamber, up into there. We put sensors all up through there. And then we put big amplifiers, big speakers in the King's Chamber, in what they call a sarcophagus. And we started to make sound, down from 300 hertz to, to zero hertz. And we found that there was an interaction in all of these chambers. And Tom Danley, our engineer, found that, the, that, in his opinion, the pyramid was an integral structure that was built to enhance these sounds. And more specifically, it was built to enhance four notes in each octave. And those four notes form an F-sharp chord. Now, again, I'm paraphrasing because I'm not the, the academic here, but the Egyptian text, ancient Egyptian text, according to Jim Hurtock, relate that the F-sharp chord was a sacred harmonic of the earth. I found out three months ago from a Yaqui shaman friend of mine who makes sacred flutes that a lot of the American 
Indian shamans and sacred flute makers tune their flutes to F sharp because it's pleasant. Mother Earth likes that sound. And so a lot of these sacred flutes halfway around the world, carved by hand out of cherry wood, have the same frequency, logic, or relevance as two and a half million blocks of stone piled up someplace halfway around the world in Egypt. More interesting than that even, when we got home, Danley called me one night in the middle of the night and he said, you'll never believe this. But he said, I've been, inve I've been investigating my tapes. And he said, even when the, when the speakers were turned off and the amplifiers were turned off, there's still tonal, there are still frequencies, there's still vibrations in the king's chamber. You can't hear them, they're below 16 hertz. They're below the human range of hearing. So he plotted them on a graph and we gave them to our musicologist and we bumped them up three octaves so you could hear them. And lo and behold, it's an F-sharp tone. So now even Boris the Skeptic was convinced and we really set about finding out what was doing it. Uh, and we started working with virtual pyramids. We created a pyramid in a computer that had smooth sides, the way the original pyramid had smooth sides. It had a capstone, as we assumed the pyramid had. It had no wooden steps or electric wires or treasure hunting tunnels or all of the incursions that have been made over the years into the pyramid. And Danley now believes that these sonic levels inside the king's chamber were created by the wind blowing across the openings of those air shafts in the same way that you'd blow across a pop bottle and make a tone. Uh, it's, it's bizarre, right? A, a wind blowing across an eight-inch hole is going to vibrate two and a half million stones. But that's what's happening. And it, since Einstein said that you can't lose energy, uh, clearly there is a, a turbulence cl created. And Danley feels the reason those air shafts are bent, or not straight, is to enhance this effect. So now we are confronted with a, a fairly interesting situation. Was this thing a sonic instrument? Was anybody ever meant to go in it? Was there ever an entrance to it? Or did they build around these chambers? Was the Grand Gallery, in fact, a resonance chamber, as the five chambers above the King's Chamber are? There's no entrance to those either. It was cut there by the treasure hunters. So we did some more exploring. And we now believe that the entrance to the Great Pyramid was from the basement room, the room underneath the Great Pyramid, down in what they call the well. And in searching the surrounding area with our seismic equipment, we uncovered another chamber that is down near the Kenkaus Pyramid, about a third of a mile uh, south and west of the Great Pyramid. And if you go down into this tomb, they call it a tomb, there is no echo no reverber reverberation. It's like a, it's, it's, it's like a Faraday chamber. Uh, Tom Danley, when he measured it and computed it, said if you were to build a chamber to have no reverberation, no vibrations at all, that would be the chamber you'd build. So now there is a, a theory emerging from all of this that perhaps the whole pyramid system, it was a system of, of immersions in a vibratory state which worked on the human body to some extent, to, for some reason. Um, could the reason have been to get out of body, to go to the afterlife? I mean, why, why did they keep mummies? Uh, the legends say that the pharaohs were taken to the afterlife and examined by the gods, and if, they, if their knowledge was sufficient, then they graduated to the afterlife. If it wasn't, they had to come back. So the question is, was the pyramid possibly a launching platform where the, where the Gnostics, where the priests took the pharaoh and they put him in his box and they opened those little doors at the end of the air shafts that got in brink bound and they bombarded him with vibrations until he had changed state somehow. And then went up there to Orion or wherever it was, wherever they lived, and with the option of coming back. So all of a sudden, we're not grounded anymore, folks, right? All of a sudden, it's gotten into a very strange area. In March, and we're going down to Mexico with Jim Hurtock, Dr. Jim Hurtock, to apply the same set of, of tests to some of the pyramids of Teotihuacan and Palenque and Uxmal, where I've never been, to see whether there's a sonic rel relevance down there as well. Because there's a very interesting fact here, in the first 1,200 years that we know there were pyramids, up until about uh, 2550 BC, 
No body of a pharaoh has ever been found in Egypt. No mummy, no body, nothing. And during the same period of time in, through, the, through the whole of Central America and Mexico, not a body of an emperor was found. Uh, one of the fascinating things about Graham Hancock is the, the similarities, the parallels he draws between what was going on in Mexico and what was going on in, in Egypt at the time. Uh, it starts to get interesting. Could it be that these pyramids were, were way stations? Could it be that, that the initiates got into the pyramid and got sent someplace? And did they all go to the same place? <laughs> was this, were these things giant 747s that took you somewhere? Uh, in, in a, took you in a physical sense. You'd go there and it, they would lower your vibrations or lower your temperature or like cryogenics of a sort. So that's what we got into and that is the kind of work that we're now doing and it's what I'm going to try and get into a little bit with our workshop tomorrow. We've talked to a lot of musical people. We've talked to people at Stanford University who are experimenting with what happens with prolonged immersion in, in a low frequency state. What happens to the body if you bombard it with ultra low frequency sound. Uh, University of Washington has got a very advanced uh, virtual reality laboratory and they are now working with virtual sound. And they, Tom Danley, is, he should be getting there probably this afternoon sometime and he's uh, three hours early. He'll be there for dinner tonight. Tom Danley is going to be working with them to try and recreate what happens when the wind blows, when a virtual wind <laughs> blows across a virtual pyramid and sends virtual vibrations down into the chamber. Um, pretty space age stuff. But what I think we're going to get from all of this is a real look at what's going on in Egypt that, that, is, that is away from all of the, all of the, all of the mythology of the mythos of the of the of the plain baloney that we hear about it I think it's I think it's a very physical place and I think they build out of stone for a reason and I think they build out of certain stones for certain reasons and they arrange them in certain ways and when we decipher all of this we'll find that the secrets of Atlantis or whatever that early civilization was I think we're going to find that it's 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 there it's ours it's it's given to us like a gift and all we have to do is understand it. It's, it's like the gentleman said it was talking about the, the crop circles here. Um, we have to see it not in our idiom. We have to see it in theirs. We have to see what it was they were trying to do. So, so that's what our work has been about. Uh, quite the opposite from what everybody says that the Egyptians, the minute you start to find something, they throw you out. That's not true at all. We, didn't, we haven't found that. They haven't thrown me out. Uh, they've invited me to come back. And I think that part of the problem has been that most of the people that have been looking over there have been looking with an agenda. They've been looking with ego, with an agenda, with, with books to sell and what have you. And I think it's gotten the Egyptians a bad rap. I don't know what anybody here in this room, what your experience has been in Egypt, but I've always been welcome there. I've always felt welcome there. They're in terrible trouble now with their industry. And so um, I feel honored that we have a chance to support them. Now, if I were the academic in my team, <laughs> I would draw some sort of a, of a, of a punchline from all of this. I would say to you, well, this is what I think it means and this is what it's supposed to be. I think what I'd like to talk a little bit about here before we have some questions is, I'm sure all of you know they've found pyramids in Japan and in China and throughout Central and South America and there's one in England and I'm told now they found one off the coast of Spain. So there is this, or was, this pyramid culture. There were a lot of pyramids, and a lot of people had them, and what were they for? What, what did they, were they all tombs? Were they all just stone monuments? Or were they part of some global technology? Were they some, some messaging system? Uh, I think we can prove what we're saying about the vibrations. I, I don't think there's any doubt about that. I think that will be proved here in the next six weeks when we get over there again. Uh, what do you all think they're for? And do you think we've succeeded in opening a line of investigation for other scientific disciplines in this country that have, that have avoided Egypt like the plague? I mean, the only people who study Egypt are, are Egyptologists and historians. Why aren't, why aren't these scientists, why aren't the space people looking? Hoagland says they are, but I don't think they are. I, I, I haven't seen anybody over there who, with, a, with, a, you know, with a computer, the 
mostly it's been history and it's been, it's been this sort of, of myth and mythology. So I hope what our, I hope what our work leads to is, is this kind of an investigation. Now, I'd like to say a little bit about the problems that we've had, because I am, after all, a filmmaker. I'd like to say a little bit about the problems that we've had in making this statement on national television. Now, there are, there are all sorts of horror stories about what goes on in Hollywood. I can only tell you that, that my experience with the Fox Television Network and Mr. Rupert Murdoch and all his good people there has been a has been a, a catastrophe in which they basically conned us into spending a lot of money producing a show which they kept telling us they were going to buy and then at the very end insisted on gutting insisted on taking out the the messages of ascension the messages of the of the possible spiritual value, value of what we're doing and I don't want to, to, to get involved in other people's areas here, but I think that, that the media in this country is controlled to a frightening degree. And especially where it involves marrying science to spirit. I can get a scientist on television and he can say anything he wants about the resonance inside that pyramid, but if I want to suggest that this resonance was used to cut us loose from our physical body, and send us on a spiritual journey. I'm back on cable, folks. I'm not on NBC anymore. I'm not on CBS. I've lost 80% of my budget, and I probably won't get on at all. That's a kind of an outrage that I think that we as, we as, as, as audience, as viewers, have to express. I think we have to talk to these networks. I think we have to demand this kind of programming. Mystery of the Sphinx had a 20 rating. It was put on during competition, the Sweeps Weeks, and it was put on opposite uh, Dances with Wolves. It was cannon fodder, and it wound up with the best rating NBC had had since the basketball championships. Now, what this should have said to them was that there's a huge audience out there that wants to know this kind of stuff, that wants Heston to talk about levitation, you know, that wants to hear about, about ascension and, and, and all of the good things that we're talking about here and that we're interested in. So how we voice this, I don't know. There are lots of people here who are good at, at voicing this sort of thing, but I've, I'm just here to tell you that as a practical matter, I have seen a, a deliberate effort by one television network to suppress what I think would have been an entertaining and an interesting, and an interesting uh, uh, point to, uh, to, to a long investigation. I just wanted to say that, I don't want to, to, to start a revolution here with this, but I, I, I thought we should slip this in. Clarence is smiling down here because some people know what we've been through here for the past seven or eight years. We are going, to tell you what we're going to do now, we're going to go to Egypt probably at the end of the third week in March. We are, I hope, going to drill a four inch hole at an angle of 45 degrees down into what we believe is a rectangular anomalous cavity under the left front paw of the Sphinx. We're going to send a camera down there with fiber optics lights, and we're going to tell everybody what's down there. Uh, I'm selling a, a little bootleg tape back there of, that shows some of the stuff we've been talking about here today, and all the proceeds from that are going towards this because the network obviously isn't going to buy it until they see it. And we're going to take 20 people who have bought the tape. We're going to draw 20 names out of a hat and take 20 people with us. And those people will get to go at our cost, whatever it is. Two of them will get to go for nothing because the airline is going to give us two tickets. And those people are going to be in the Sphinx enclosure watching the monitor when that camera goes down there. So there will be no secrecy this time. And these are 20 people from this audience or from the Art Bell audience. This could be anybody. And they're going to be there, and they're going to have monitors, and they're going to be able to see what's on that camera, and there ain't going to be no baloney about it. It's going, to, it's, it's going to be there for everybody to see. So that's a pledge, and that's what we're going to be doing in the next few weeks. Uh, we are also going to do some more sonic tests down there to match what we're doing in Mexico, and we're going to try and go a little bit further with that, with that line of investigation. 
to see what we can do in the laboratory to recreate these vibrational states and to see whether or not these vibrational states uh, can induce out-of-body experience, can induce, can induce trance, can induce states that are more receptive to healing. There are a lot of people doing this work. I think what we can do is crystallize that and attract a lot of attention to it and then possibly get these people together. There's some people here who, who certainly healed me of some ailments today with vibrations and uh, I've been wearing a box here for three days. It took the pain out of my knees and uh, there's some amazing stuff going on right here in this room that is that should be mainstream. People should know about this. People should be able to buy this at the drugstore instead of aspirin, you know? And, and, and the horror that we're living with is or one of the many horrors we live with is the fact that it's illegal. It's illegal. It's, 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 it's in the closet, you know? We're not talking about it. So I don't know why that is. Now, before we go any further, has anybody got any questions? Does anybody like to ask any questions about what we've done so far? Yes, I think I think they want you to go to a microphone, ma'am. Just want to maybe just like to take a, a break in this diatribe and, and ask me some questions, and then we'll get, I'll tell you some more good stuff. Yes, I'm a retired musician, uh, uh, musician, and uh, still working now as a piano tuner. I was in a great pyramid, uh, King's Chamber, and I asked so many people, what makes such a beautiful acoustics? which goes against the acoustical rules. Any, any time someone is singing uh, towards the wall, the, uh, the voice, I mean the sound, bounces back in 90 degrees. Now, the uh, king chamber is a 90 degrees box, but the acoustics, the, 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 whatever singing or playing, is just unbelievable. I was in so many uh, concert halls in Germany, Poland, Italy, Italy uh, Japan, uh, Manila, and so on. I never, I never run into this kind of acoustics. What is the reason? Okay, I am not the acoustic genius to this. Um, I can tell you that it is a combination of measurement and the consistency of the stones that are used, the placement of the materials. And it has a lot to do with the chambers above and below the king's chamber. I can't give you a technical answer. I said there was good news and bad news before I started. The bad news is I'm not technical. And so I can't answer specifically what dimensions create the sound. I can tell you that the pyramid was designed to enhance the sound. And as you just so elegantly put it, it enhances the sound. But that's all I can tell you. I can't tell you what the combination is. I can't draw you a, a plan for going home and making your own resonance chamber. But I can tell you that according to our experts, it was engineered, it was done on purpose. It was done, it's, it's logic. It's not, it's not by chance. Uh, uh, Fisher Hall in New York, uh, is this? Uh, Fisher Hall in, in New York, uh, originally was built like a long box good for nothing. They have to turn down and beat another building and the walls are never, uh, they never go in 90 degrees. Always a little bit uh, either, either over or less. Now the acoustics, uh, I was in the Fisher Hall uh, way back in a, uh, in a uh, how you call it? <laughs> uh, and a, ch a cellist was playing on a, on a, fl on a uh, what do you call on a f uh, stage. I get the impression as I was standing a step away from the cello on a stage. This is the, acoustic, uh, those are the acoustical law uh, that we have to follow to get good uh, sounding uh, well, results. Now again, I'm coming back to the king, king's chamber. This is straight box and it's against the uh, laws we know now. Why? <laughs> well, I don't know why. <laughs> That's a simple. I have no idea. I think it has to do with the chamber, with the spaces. I think I think that the grand gallery has something to do with it. I think that the chambers around surrounding the chamber have something to do with it. But I can't answer your question. <laughs> By uh, I mentioned. Uh, Nice, good uh, acoustics. I can demonstrate on the piano a little bit. Uh, shall I do it or? Uh, next question. No. I'm sorry. I think afterwards, maybe. Okay. Come, to, come to the workshop tomorrow and we'll do it. 
How many were shot? I'm sorry, yes. Just a bit of observation on what he was saying. Uh, in a recording studio, they don't put any parallel or perpendicular walls to not, they try to nullify any, uh, anything echoing around the room and interfering with other microphones uh, recording other in instruments. So I know that if you point a speaker towards a corner, and I know that when it goes around a series of 45 degree angles, the sound is amplified. That's how uh, butterfly bass uh, speaker bins you see at a rock concert, the stacks and stacks of them, that's how they're engineered. Anyway, my question is, uh, you say it forms an F-sharp chord, and I'm wondering if that's major or minor, so that would be F-sharp, C-sharp, and is that B-flat or A? I can't answer your question. Okay. I, I tell you, I, no, let me, let me, let me, no, let me qualify so it this would be F-sharp minor, then? It's, it's, I believe that it's an F-sharp minor, but my problem is, again, as I said, I am the, I'm, I'm the guy that made the movie. The F-sharp chord um, is described I guess simplistically in the ancient Egyptian text. When I asked Ward Stroud, who makes flutes in Oregon, sacred flutes, and I said, hey, what do you tune your flutes to, Ward? He said, F sharp. It blew my circuits completely. I think we're going to get into this. Fritz Heed, who's our composer, is going over with us next time. We're taking a musicologist with us. We are going to answer your question. We're going to have a look and find out. I think what we found is just the tip of the iceberg, and if we can get people like yourself, musical people, interested in this thing, I mean, somebody said to me, F sharp, that's a, was, you know, a Purple Haze was F sharp, Jimi Hendrix, right? Uh, I don't know. I know that was one of the best pieces he ever did, is one of my favorite pieces of music. If that's F sharp, that's phenomenal. A lot of people have said to me here at this conference that a lot of bells and, and, and sacred chimes and things that they've had vibrate to that same frequency. So I think the subtleties of it are what we're hoping to provoke. That's what we're trying to do is get into this. Yeah, there's. Uh, Boris, you. Um, you mentioned earlier uh, in your talk that uh, you were looking for people to contact the networks, perhaps, and express interest. Um, I began to think along those lines that if potential advertisers or people who generally advertise on the networks were contacted, that would make a big difference. And I, uh, I know where I'm going to start because I know someone in the advertising business who works with Toyota, so I'm going to work on that one, but I thought maybe other people here might know someone in the advertising business who could then get a connection. And also I was wondering if Moses himself uh, were the host for the show, would that help? <laughs> I'm thinking of Charlton Heston, uh, and I'm um, thinking that you were looking for enough weight that would, and I know you've, a film has already done, been done with Charlton, should we have um, you know, Charlton in part two? Well, this? he's actually, he's willing. Uh, uh -huh. He started out very skeptical about this whole thing. How old is the Sphinx? It's 2500 BC, you know, he didn't want to know. He became convinced during the two days that we filmed him, he began to understand we were onto something. And yes, people like that will help. And if we can get this sequel, on television, it's also going to help a lot. Do you currently have a connection with Charlton or? Yes, I do. Okay. I do. And I with NBC as well, and they're just waiting to see if we can get into that room. I can tell you that I have heard three stories that should be documentaries on primetime television since, since I've been here. And I'm sure they're all going to have the same problem I have, and that is getting by the, the nerd that sits at the desk and says, this isn't of general interest because nobody's getting his arm ripped off. <laughs> that's, that's, that's what we're stuck with. Yeah, man. Uh, uh, Zahi Hawass told Art Bell that the Great Pyramid is going to be closed for six months uh, for cleaning, um, and he assured Art Bell that there was going to be no drilling done during that time. Now, I've been in the pyramid. It was January of 1997. I would say if they want to sweep the floors in there, maybe a week, what are they going to do for six months? <laughs> That's a great question. Um, Zahi Hawaz is a very complex and interesting character, and I'm not going to say any more about it than that. He's been very good to me. He introduced me to the girl I later married. Um, he is something less than a reliable source of information about what's happening in Egypt. Let me put it as kindly as I can. I heard they were going to close the pyramid for six months. I can't imagine they're going to do that in the face of the biggest tourist catastrophe in history. 
Uh, we were just told two days ago that we could have access to do our sonic testing. Uh, I heard the Art Bell show. I heard him say five things that were figments of somebody's imagination that just simply aren't true. So why he's saying that, why they're doing that, why that's all happening, I don't know. I, ca I can't answer that question. Um, what I would like to say is that you've all pointed up something very interesting here. Uh, the networks, people that I talk to, everybody says, are you going to find Atlantis? Are you going to open the Hall of Records? But the questions are about the sound. The questions are about resonance, that sort of thing. I agree with those questions. I think that the really interesting thing here is this is this relic, this monument, that's 480 feet high. It's just sitting there for all the world to see. It's on our dollar bill, okay? And it has, a, it has properties. It does stuff. Uh, I will tell you something it did to me in a minute. Let me ask this, this lady who's waiting to ask a question. Go ahead, ma'am, I'm sorry. Did I understand you correctly that when you said in the king's chamber that, um, that human beings cannot hear different tones and singing and um, harmonics when no one's playing them in there? Uh, what, I, what I said was that below 16 hertz, which is below the hu range of human hearing, there are peaks. There are tones and peaks all the way down to half a hertz. And between 9 hertz and half a hertz, which you can't hear, there is a continuation of the graph that starts at 200 hertz. You can't hear it, but if you plot those high points on a scale and then raise it three octaves to where it's audible, it, it's the same notes. So have any of you heard singing and toning and um, uh, harps in there without no. music being played? No. I, I have not. I have, I have been in there when people played the harp. Okay. Uh, I know people that have had that experience. I think it's a legitimate experience. I think they have that experience. Mm -hmm. That wasn't what I was referring to. What I was really referring to was the fact that on our instruments, our instruments measured things you could not hear. Right. Now, it may very well be that you're in there and, those, and you, hear, uh, you hear an echo of those tones. I don't know. We do, and many do. Well, I, I can tell you that I, I know a lot of people that have had that experience. I want to close by telling you a story. And I wasn't going to tell you the story, but since <laughs> Dean said I got busted for doing 180 miles an hour on the beach, I guess you believe anything, but that happens to be true. <laughs> when I went to Egypt, I didn't believe a whole lot of this stuff. I, I was interested. I thought Egypt was a great adventure. I love horses. They have Arabian horses there. And I started making this movie for John Anthony West, who I knew in school. And uh, he's a very funny character. He's a great character. And one night, because I was very enamored at that point of one of our lady assistants who insisted on spending a night in the king's chamber, I went and bribed the guy with the key, and we bought a night in the king's chamber. And we went up there, and she plotted the exact center of the room in the king's chamber, and she lay down there with her pillow, and we had the lights turned out. We lit some candles, and I had four little speakers, a little Sony player, and I had some Tibetan chants that Jim Hurtock had given me. So I got in the sarcophagus, or in the echo box, and I set up my four speakers. And the candles burned down, and it got dark, and she started to snore. And, uh, <laughs> and I turned on the music. <laughs> and it got really scary. I began to see blue lights. I began to see, like, blue cobwebs. and. The place began to echo, and I got really scared. And I lit my flashlight, and I turned off the music, and I got up, and I had a drink of water. And then I talked to myself, and I said, this is ridiculous. I, Come on, you know, get back in the box, right, you chicken? So I get back in the box, and I turned on the music, and I lay there quietly. And after a while, the blue lights came again. And they were just like blue cobwebs. And the next thing I knew, the pyramid, the whole top of the pyramid opened up, and I was walking in the rain. Now, it was July in Egypt, 1962, July 8th. And I thought, well, you're making a movie about the Sphinx being damaged by rainwater and floods, and you dummy, you're in the pyramid, and you've fallen asleep, and you're dreaming, you know. So enjoy the dream, right? And so I'm dreaming about walking in the rain, and I walked down to the foot of the pyramid, and the little village of Nazlet Saman was there. And, and there's a cafe where a bunch of us play backgammon at night, a bunch of local horse guys that I ride with. 
And they were sitting under an awning playing backgammon at a big long picnic table sort of thing, you know, two benches and a, a table. And so I sat down and we're playing backgammon for beers. I don't know how many of you here play backgammon, but I always, all of a sudden, had a phenomenal run of doubles. Double six twice, double four, and double one twice in a row. Five rolls, they turned over their backgammon piece. The guy said, here's your beer. We're never going to play this game with you again. <laughs> the next thing I knew, uh, somebody was shaking me, and I was up in the box in the pyramid. I woke up. I felt myself to see if I was dry, and I was dry. And I said, damn, you know, I, had a, I, I slept through the whole thing. So we were coming down the steps, and this girl is babbling to me about purple crystals and glass mountains and going through waterfalls and archangels and all this neat stuff that was happening to her, right? And I was sort of wishing I was on what she was on. <laughs> I was thinking to myself, well, you dummy, you, you, you went for a walk in the rain and played backgammon, and I mean, and this, is, this is your big experiment in the no Nefertiti nothing, right? <laughs> Walked out of the pyramid at 6 o'clock in the morning, and it was raining. And it had been raining folks, there were puddles, okay? So she looked at me and she said, oh my God, it's been raining, you know? Now I didn't told her, I told her we'd played backgammon, that's all I told her. So in the taxi on the way back to the hotel, I wrote down my string of doubles and I put it in my wallet. And we went on about our business, we went into town, we met a plane full of people, we did a lot of work, we took some people to dinner, it got to be 11 o'clock at night, and I said to the girl, let's go back to the, to the cafe, play a little backgammon. And she said, I don't want to go. And I said, well, look, I'd really like to go. I'd like to see whether they had the experience. She said, come on, you know, you quit while you're winning. You dreamed about the rain. That was great. So in the taxi going back to the, to the cafe, I pulled out the piece of paper. And I said, here, Anne, you played backgammon. I said, here was my set of doubles. This is, these were my first five rolls last night, and they quit. So we got to the, to the, to the cafe, and the... Um, awning was up and the guys were all sitting at the table playing backgammon and we sat down at the end and I said, all right guys for beers. And my friend Mohammed, who handles my horse turned to me and he said, look, we told you last night, we're never going to play this game with you again. <laughs> now wait, there's more folks, there's more. And those of you that go to Egypt, I will tell you how to find a cafe. <laughs> so he said, what we did do was this. And he said, we made you a monument. He said, we made you a hieroglyph. It's the Boris Cartouche. And they had carved into the wooden table six plus six x two, four plus four, and one plus one x two. True story. Okay. So, and I'll answer some questions on that. But <laughs> I hope we're almost out of time. But if there are any other questions, I'll be happy to answer them. But that—that that was my experience in the Great Pyramid. Now, yes, ma'am. This is not a question. This is a suggestion that I'd like to make. When you go to Mexico at the citadel where the Serpent Plumes Monument and temples are, you can speak to the serpent. If you, dead, if you stand dead center, Back here. if you Close to the mark. what do you do? Close okay. Oh, oh, come on, guys. <laughs> Be nice now, guys. The uh, serpent will speak to you. You clap your hands, and it squawks like a bird. Really? If you go to the side, what is it, the left or the right? I don't remember. At the left, it'll say one thing. To the right, it'll say another. Dead center, it speaks just to you. Now, there's thousands of people all around. Nobody hears it but you. Really? Yes, speaking of sounds. I will do that. Yeah. I don't uh, doubt it for a minute. No, 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 go. Right no. there in the center. And uh, they'll, they'll tell you about it. Or you, you Thank do you. it yourself. I'll try it. Thanks very much. Anybody else? Boris, did you want to uh, no, do the I, video? No, I, I got through it. I just thought, you know, it, it wasn't that important to really locate it, to pinpoint it. I had a, I had a diagram of where the well was. Uh, if any of you have any further questions, what I've got back there at Table 17 is a 41-minute video, which is a combination of our, of our, um, of our mystery of the Sphinx tape with Charlton Heston, which has got some of the, some of the levitation experiments we did with Tom Danley. It's also got some footage down in the well where we discovered the tunnel. And it shows the tunnel on radar and all of that. And it's also got some of the sort of an overview of the, of the resonance testing that we did in the Great Pyramid and uh, some of the F-sharp tones that come out of that sacred flute. 
So if any of you are interested, please come back. Tomorrow at my workshop from 8.30 to 11.30, I'm gonna show a lot of the film, which is the subject of this lawsuit. Uh, a lot of the footage of us rappelling down into this well and, and the actual radar work in progress and a bunch of stuff that, that I think otherwise you probably will not get to see. Time is up, the man says. One more question. Did you have a question? Go ahead, Matt. The color that you saw, the beautiful blue, was the co color of the macabre. And that's how you, tell, you get to the game at the cafe was you activated, I call it your burkaba, but they've been pronouncing it a little bit differently here. And that's how you got from the inside of the king's chamber to the game. Thank you. Back. Thank you for that. I, uh, I wish it had been that obvious and logical to me at the time. I spent months wondering if there was shrink in the world that I could find that could help me. I'll tell you that. Thank you all very much for coming. I hope to okay, see you tomorrow. Thank you. Come back and buy the tape.